and welcome to Spy Hards Podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. More fan! More fan! More fan! And I'm Cam the Provocateur. Is that a cry for us to get more fans? <laughs> it is indeed, yes. Yes, that's exactly what I was going for, Scott. Yes, we want more fans. <laughs> singular right now it's a, right now it's an only fan sure yeah yeah i mean yeah. I'm, I'm debasing myself on the regular for you all and uh not feeling the love yet <laughs> well i mean we turn up every week do people turn up to hear us debase ourselves so i i i promise at least that that we'll give you the bare minimum of us debasing ourselves every week okay and loving it for every second that was a little get smart there i like that yeah Mm, good stuff. Well, before we get to this week's film, it's been a little while, and uh, I think it's about time we induct a very new Spy Hards Die Hard. Okay, let's do it. Well, for those who haven't actually uh, Spy Hards Die Harded before, Cam, how does one become a Spy Hards Die Hard? By leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and writing a review telling people what you appreciate about Spy Hards, letting the world know, essentially, and then we read that review on the show and give you your top-secret Spy Hards Die Hards nickname. Yes, that might seem like an impossible mission, but if you hop over to Apple Podcasts, leave that five-star review, you can say whatever you'd like, as long as it's a five-star review. We'll probably read it on air. I mean, you should hear Cam's attempt at a Scottish accent from a few weeks ago. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. Or don't. Or don't. Don't track that one down at all. I mean, talking about debasing ourselves online. I was going to say, I was going to say, yes, that exact thing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But this one, this one's a little easier. Um, but it does set a challenge for you, Cam. So prepare yourself. Okay. This comes from Kickin' Impossible in the United States of America. Essential spy listening. Five stars. I've listened to this show for years. I'm a huge Mission Impossible fan, and I've discovered a lot of new movies that I otherwise would not know about. And they give great code names. Yeah, that really set me up. So, um, enjoy your new nickname, Mission Guy. <laughs> is, is, that, is that what it is? No, of course not. I was going to say, because like, Kicking Impossible, is that they're, they're like, Handle is actually better than Mission Guy. I'd say stick with that. <laughs> I was trying to come up with the lamest thing I could based off of Mission Impossible, and so that's where my mind went. <laughs> I would have just gone with Cam Smith on that one. Oh. Oh. Well, that's too tragic. Oh, yeah. That is just... You can't go down that road. Trust me, no one wants to go down that road, least of all me. <laughs> Cam regrets going down that road, and he had no choice. I'm being dragged down that road, kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> but go on, Cam. I think I've got it. Okay. And... I wanted to do something that's very Mission Impossible, mm -hmm. like Mission Impossible to the core, not something where you have to explain it to someone and be like, well, that's a term for Mission Impossible. Sure. And this is one, it's going to seem obvious, but I don't think I've ever heard anyone use this before. Cut to like millions of people using it <laughs> colloquially. Well, true. Just not in Canada. Fuse lighter. Is that just a, another word for arsonist? No, it's the fuse. <laughs> it is the epitome of what Mission Impossible is all about. It's the ticking clock. It is the iconic light the fuse. I think fuse lighter is pretty damn good. Okay. I mean, th y your job is to pick the code name. So I have to bow down to your alleged uh, credentials in this area. Congratulations, fuse lighter. That is your new nickname. Please do not use it on legal documentation. We cannot uh, sign off on that. But you can use it anywhere else online and, uh, of course, in Spy Hard Circles as well. So uh, and if you want to get a cool nickname, I'll use cool in air quotes, make sure you leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And Cam, I don't want to source the goose too much, but we've got some very special guests lined up for this week's film. And speaking of fuse lighters, how about we get to that very film? Okay, Cam, we have a mission for everyone this week, but with all good missions, we need a team. And so I sought out a specialist. Joining us on the show, she is a award-winning writer, film critic, essayist, and historian at filmintuition.com, and she hosts a podcast, Watch With Jen. It's Jen Johans. Hello, Jen. How are you? I am great. Hello, guys. Thank you so much for inviting me. 
No, glad to have you joining our own little makeshift IMF here. Uh, and I think this mission mm -hmm. is going to be thoroughly exciting. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think before we get into the mission, as it were, we need to sort of check your spy credentials because it's your first time on Spy Hard's podcast. We need to make sure you're up to up to muster. You know, are people <laughs> going to throw fruit at you because you don't know enough stuff? We need to know. Okay. So it's a softball question, but I'll throw it up front. Jen, what's your favorite spy movie? Oh my goodness, that <laughs> is. It's the million dollar question. Really on tough. Show. You know, I mean, I've done a few uh, episodes on various incarnations of Bond. I did one on Pierce Brosnan, one on Roger Moore. But I, I kind of think Skyfall might be the one that I watched the most. I mean, mm. first of all, Daniel Craig is amazing, but also you have Javier Bardem being handsy with Craig's thighs, calling Judy Dench mommy. I mean, you get a little bit of campiness in there. It's almost like El Motivar wandered over to the set <laughs> and directed a couple scenes. Um, you know, Spy Who Came In From The Cold is a classic. There's a great one with James Mason called Five Fingers. That's really good. Yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, my God. A shout out to Five Fingers. This is incredible. Three Days of the Condor is incredible. I love a lot of spy movies. I am kind of partial to probably this is the ultimate of all time it would be Falcon and the Snowman because wow. I'm from Minnesota originally and actually have some relatives who are in law enforcement and uh, remember like Christopher Boyce being in the penitentiary right there. So we heard that story and I love that film. I love Schlesinger, those actors. So I'd have to say probably Falcon of the Snowman. Yeah. I mean, you've you've wowed us with that because <laughs> not often, firstly, do you get a mention of Five Fingers, which is a firm favorite here on the show. Yeah. It's like a, that's like a secret spy movie people don't know about should go and check out. We did an episode on it ages ago. But Falcon and the Snowman, the, the movie where they make a margarita in a paper shredder, my favorite little, uh, yeah. little weird thing in that film that will stick <laughs> in my memory forever absolutely yes um well that's 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 doing pretty well um i think you're already like winning the hearts of the listeners and i'd like to know like going back i was sort of reading about i was on filmintuition.com having a look around where did your love of film come from or where did that sort of start you wanting to write as well um i always had it as a kid actually the the one and only time i got in trouble in school, it was in second grade. I was talking about movies during quiet time and had to go write my name on the board. So I think maybe, you know, learning that I could actually write about film and I wouldn't get in trouble that way because, you know, then I could say whatever I wanted uh, was probably the way to go. I just always was passionate about movies. And yeah, I mean, I, I was like the film critic in middle school and high school and I started college kind of early so i was the geek that was constantly like you guys only offer one film class can we do more um so yeah i just always loved film did your parents like encourage this what started as a hobby or passion like did you have access to a lot of classic films or was it kind of working with what you could get you know at the local video store and going from there uh, my mom worked in a library when i was little and so she would bring movies home but my parents always loved movies. They didn't have like a huge special knowledge of them. They just enjoyed them and were pretty liberal with what we could watch. So, I mean, I don't think my mom loved the idea uh, that I saw Platoon when I was like eight and Die Hard when I was eight. Oh, wow. So I was like the kid in fourth grade, you know, all the other kids were talking about like you know, Matthew Broderick and stuff from like Willem Dafoe and Forrest Whitaker you know so i was i was into the character actors um my parents you know they just encouraged any passion i had i taught myself how to write scripts when i was in sixth grade for fun i just got that idea myself and without like telling my parents um started to submit scripts to like tv shows and stuff like that so i was just yeah a nerd i guess from a kid well, you're in good company here. We're nerds right. about spy yeah. movies, and Cam has been, you know, doing film criticisms, uh, you know, for many, many years himself. He used, he's had a, he used to have a podcast back when podcasts weren't cool, which is uh, saying something. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Back in 2008, I guess. I don't even know if they're cool now, though. Like, well, I was going to say, Scott, yeah. you're being a little nice to us right there when you're yeah. saying podcasts are cool. <laughs> I'm not sure if they are. 
Well, I, I think that's like uh, self-defacing stuff you've got going on there. I'm a British guy on a podcast talking about films. Of course I'm cool. Like, I just project <laughs> cool. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't sound anything like a James Bond. I don't think any James Bond would be quite as nasally as I am. Uh, the name Spawn, James Bond, just pinch your nose. But no, I... Um, I, I think it is kind of cool. It's a way of expressing your love for something. And that's really what like geeks and nerds do is they, they nerd out about something and we do it about spy movies. So I'm saying firmly, it is cool. Can't argue with that then. Okay. Sure. That positive statements all around. And my last question before we give you the rubber stamp and send you through checkpoint, Charlie, Jen, <laughs> we're going to talk about a mission film here that we'll talk about in a second. But were you watching the Mission Impossible films contemporaneously when they were coming out? Did you have any yeah. sort of experience with You were? Okay, so mm -hmm. what were your sort of thoughts on the first three before we get into talking about the fourth one? Um, well, I actually just covered the first one in an episode on TV adaptations. Mm -hmm. I saw that one in the theater right away. A uh, huge De Palma fan. I mean, I love how horny it is. First of all, <laughs> I think people forget that because the new ones are so sexless. Mm -hmm. But you go back and you're like, <laughs> yeah. whoa. Um, so like that was happening. Uh, it's weird. My favorite quote about the first one was... Um, and I did see it. It was like the end of the school year. I remember leaving school and going, I think, with my brother to the theater and, you know, packed audience, played like gangbusters. We went back a couple times with other people and stuff. But my favorite quote was Denzel Washington was on Entertainment Tonight. Uh, and, you know, they ask celebrities stupid questions. And one of the questions just happened to be, it wasn't even at the premiere for Mission Impossible. It was like, did you see Mission Impossible? What did you think? Denzel decided to just be totally honest. He goes, am I stupid or was that hard to understand? And uh, I thought that was really funny because the first time you watch that movie, how many goddamn times do they say the phrase knock list? a lot right mm -hmm. and so it gets really confusing the first time you watch it there's all the the dutch angles the you know all the de palma things happening but then then you watch it again and you watch it again and i mean i love how subversive it is too in addition to the horniness and the weirdness you also have they kill off Kristen Scott Thomas and Emilio Estevez like immediately. So you start the movie and you're lulled into, oh, it's Emilio. This is going to be fun. And then, okay, Emilio's dead. Um, so I, I just loved it. And I loved how the next one, I'm a huge John Woo person. Mm. So I loved um, the next one was like a totally different thing. It's notorious, but um, notorious, of course town notorious uh it's, it's still horny but it's it's john woo we have doves uh we have way too many masks we're doing the mask a little <laughs> too much um the third movie totally different thing so it's kind of like it becomes a different animal everything the most important thing i think that happened in the third movie was introducing simon Pegg for sure mm -hmm. so yeah i love these i i watched them you know from the beginning yeah. How about you guys? Can you imagine a world? Well, I mean, we're we're just beginning our journey with the mission films. Although we both caught them, most of them in in theaters. I mean, Mission Two yeah. was very important for me growing up because I was a new metal head. So okay. the, the soundtrack was just top notch. Yeah. So we actually yeah. did an interview with the guy who made the soundtrack, and that is a great like two hour interview. That oh, like, that's awesome. The deepest of dives you could ever want to go for that. Um, but I also love Two just because it is a notorious rip off. And I love Notorious. I have the poster up behind me. Yeah. It is like my favorite spy movie of all time. So, of course, I'm on board. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. One of the best Hitchcocks, for sure. Yeah. And the original Mission Impossible for me was a huge deal. That was one of those early movies where I was as confused as Denzel was. Yeah. Where I watched it and I went, huh? And it was a movie I watched over and over again with a friend. And we just pieced it out and figured it all out. And I look back now and it's actually relatively easy to understand yes <laughs> in comparison to kind of the bloated convoluted plots we work into blockbusters now but that movie was also kind of like training people for the future to come yeah i mean it isn't an inherent vice you know but but it felt like it at the time you're like what are we watching here what's going on with these knock lists but uh but yes no that's great we'll, we'll come back to the knock list don't worry we're, that 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 we're gonna <laughs> mention later in the show but uh, I, it sounds like your uh, spy credentials are pretty up to snuff. So I'm going to stamp you. We're going to head on through. Okay. Welcome aboard, Jen. 
I think you're ready for it. Cam, what's our mission? Yes, we are tackling Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol from 2011, directed by Brad Bird. I have been looking forward to talking about this one because this is a film that often gets thrown at us online. Also just saying, hey guys, you've been podcasting about spy movies for four years. Why haven't you spoken about this film yet? Yeah. And that's a good question. But also, a lot of people point to this as like the one, it's like the gold finger of the mission films. It's the one that sort of set the real template that will be used, basically copy and paste wholesale the entire way through all the next films. Mm -hmm. I would actually point more towards Mission 3 for a lot of that, but we'll talk about it. Let's break it down for those who have never seen Ghost Protocol. Here is your synopsis. Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol. No plan, no backup, no choice. Ethan Hunt and his team are racing against time to track down a dangerous terrorist named Hendrix, who has gained access to Russian nuclear launch codes and is planning a strike on the United States. An attempt to stop him ends in an explosion causing severe destruction of the Kremlin and the IMF to be implicated in the bombing, forcing the president to disavow them. No longer being aided by the government, Ethan and his team chase Hendrix around dot 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 more. <laughs> oh no the globe although they might still be too late to stop a disaster that's a, a very wordy notably this is also the first mission impossible film to not have a imf agent as your villain wow yeah right yeah i did, i'd never put that together actually and and this is he's gone back to his ways of going rogue again uh, i think he, he he didn't go rogue a little bit in the th in the third one i think it was or the second one uh the second one he never goes rogue mm so uh, Ethan's back on track of uh, sticking it to the man. But yeah, that's a, this is the first time. Uh, but also, I, when I was reading that synopsis, and this is maybe a spoiler for my thoughts later, I read Hendrix and had to stop and think about who that was. Right. We'll talk about that a bit later. Yeah. <laughs> and Cam, before we dig any deeper into the film, we have to announce next week's guests. Yes, we do. And they are two dynamos. Dynamos. Joining us next tuesday you can tune in to hear us talk with mr greg smurs who was the stunt coordinator on mission impossible ghost protocol he is the man who put together the burj khalifa not the actual building itself but certainly the sequence <laughs> yeah he, he was very ambitious <laughs> i mean the guy has big aspirations and you'll find out more about that next tuesday and then coming out on the friday because the fun doesn't stop just there we are sitting down with mr Ilya volok who plays the fog in this film he's got some very interesting stories about uh, working alongside mr tom cruise and he's also worked on a ton of other spy movies that we get into as well so both not ones to miss out on and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the show yeah, there is a ton of really cool behind-the-scenes details in these interviews. So, folks, strap yourselves in. Uh, well, the first question I'll ask everyone is, you know, Jen, you were watching these contemporaneously when they were coming out. I want to hear from you before maybe you get to your thoughts of this film now. When you saw this film in theaters back in 2011, what did you think? Oh, I loved it. Actually, you know, I don't remember my first viewing of it, but I remember I was in a hospital around the time I have a genetic thing and I was stuck in there for like two weeks and uh, in American hospitals, luckily they have like some newer films. Mm -hmm. And the two that I watched the most were Moneyball and Ghost Protocol. And for whatever reason, I mean, it got to the point where it was like, this might be the 12th time I've watched uh, Ghost Protocol this week. I don't care. Um, I remember it just being a blast. Uh, it's funny if you ask me like, what is the first scene in the movie? I'm like, ain't that a kick in the head, but it isn't. Uh, but I think that's when you realize you're in the hands of something really special here because you have Brad Bird falling back on the Pixar of it all, his animation background. Um, it's, you know, Tom Cruise is kind of one of those brilliant stuntmen. Of course, everyone knows that, mm -hmm. but he has a musicality. We've seen it, um, you know, Magnolia, Jerry Maguire on that level, but we also, we get to see the physicality and the musicality working together there. So I just loved that. I remember this would be the first viewing, the one in the theater where I, I didn't know where it was going after that. Like, where could this possibly go? Like, we're back in weird territory here with Mission Impossible. And then we're, 
you know, we're doing the thing down the hall of the Kremlin and uh, then we're on the building and, uh, you know, 25 minutes to door knock. Everything in that movie gets crazier and crazier. It's my favorite one by far. Yeah. I had the exact same experience with films in hospitals and a long stay and Star Trek 2009. Mm. Yeah, so, I, I I also have a, a condition that has made me spend plenty of time in hospitals, and yeah, they just had like a pay per view channel you could just hire hire it for the whole week. <laughs> I think I just I watched Star Trek two thousand nine, maybe twenty times that week. It for was sure. crazy. Yeah, JJ Abrams Productions. Look at yeah. us. Seems to be like the go to for hospitals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's keeping people cheered up. I feel bad for that hospital that has Rise of Skywalker just on an endless loop. Oh. Like, you know, mm. you know, it's interesting you mentioned <laughs> the, the musicality of Tom Cruise, though, because, you know, the moment that puts him on the map is risky business dancing to rock music. Yeah, it kind of all stems, mm -hmm. you know, all the way back to 83. Yeah. And I'll, I'll note no one mentioned uh, Rock of Ages when it comes to Tom Cruise and musicality. <laughs> no, uh, he's fun <laughs> in that movie. He's fun. Uh, well, uh, what about you, Cam? Any memories from uh, long ago? I remember a lot of the kind of mostly gossip i don't know how much was actually based in fact leading up to mission impossible 4 which was that three had come out despite really enjoying it it was not a big box office hit and so there was a mm -hmm. lot of rumors that they were going to move on from tom cruise and i remember just reading gossip stories about how brad pitt may step in and take over the franchise and things like that and so when this one rolled out it kind of felt like a oh well here it is. Let's go see how it is. It didn't feel like it arrived with fanfare. Like, you must see Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. It was kind of a wait-and-see kind of movie. And I remember going with my buddy and being absolutely blown away by not just, like, the Burj Khalifa sequence, but all of the action through the film and a lot of the comedy. Like, it felt like a genuine crowd-pleaser. Yeah. And it just kind of hit every note you could expect or want in a Mission Impossible film. And it felt so confident that while there was a lot of rumors going into the movie that Tom Cruise was kind of setting up Jeremy Renner to take over the franchise and elements like that, you walked out going, well, I want this team back together. Mm -hmm. Like Tom Cruise killed this movie and I want to see more of this world. And I think that kind of, you know, kind of makes sense why, um, well, Jeremy Renner is not headlining Dead Reckoning Part 2. No, although will we see him again? He has a three picture deal and he's only done two of those pictures. So it's all up for grabs. Maybe? Maybe I I I I'm a, I'm I not, hope so. I hope so too. too. I'm not anti Jeremy Renner. I no. I had the Renner app. I'm one of those guys. You know, I was uh, full on board the Renner train. Mm, yeah. Hey, I interviewed him right out of the gate there with uh, Hurt Locker. He was a great guy. Yeah. There you go. And th I think wasn't Hurt Locker the film that got him this more or less, like timeline wise. Yes. Yeah. And um, there was this strange quote I still remember where um. Tom Cruise said that he held secrets in his eyes and that's what he saw when he he chose him. Yep. Interesting. And I actually know that Super 8 was a key movie as well because Jeremy Renner auditioned or not auditioned, but went and had a meeting for Super 8. Yeah. And J.J. Abrams was like, you know what? This isn't really right for you, but, but I want to work with you later down the road. And then boom, mm -hmm. Mission Impossible. There you go. Mm -hmm. There you uh, go. As for me, answering my own question, I remember... I mean, I remember really enjoying Mission Impossible 3, so I wasn't, like, downbeat about the franchise, and I wasn't really tuned into the gossip mill or anything like that. I just sort of, oh, it's a new Mission film, of course I'm going to go and see it. There hadn't really been a big tentpole spy movie in a while. You'd had Quantum in 2008. Um, there's been some other bits and bobs that have come out, but really the big franchises, it was pretty quiet until you'd have Skyfall the following year after this. Uh, so, yeah, I remember going and just absolutely loving it, and, and the Burj Khalifa at the time, and it still does blows me away mm -hmm. yeah yeah there was also just the fact it was like a five-year gap between three and five or between three and four i should say as well that really kind of it didn't build the hype necessarily like you're kind of like oh this feels a little bit like an afterthought at the time yeah this is one of the longest periods in between films i think but two to three was six years this is five years yeah that's right yeah yeah um well let's Let's answer that question. Let's fill in those gaps. Let's go behind the scenes and Cam, tell us the story of how we went from Mission Impossible 3 to everyone going ghost. So Paramount and Tom Cruise didn't have the best of relationships coming out of Mission Impossible 3. 
You had, we talked about the couch jumping incident and just various uh, behaviors Tom Cruise was exhibiting in press around that point that Paramount mm -hmm. wasn't happy with them. And they'd actually dropped his production company, the United Artists Studio, in 2006. Mm -hmm. But in 2008, they kind of made up and decided to collaborate again. And they decided Mission Impossible 4 would be what they would do going forward. And the idea was they're going to develop a script and green light it as soon as that script was good enough to shoot. And for Tom Cruise, this is kind of a weird period because he's doing movies like Lions for Lambs. He's shot Valkyrie. It hasn't come out yet. But it's kind of a point in time where he's kind of struggling a bit at the box office. People aren't really accepting what he's doing. And so something like Mission Impossible 4 makes a lot of sense for him at this point in time. Well, I, I'm trying to think. I, I haven't seen Valkyrie, so I don't know how much that is in, in terms of a career saver. But this feels like the exact sort of thing a star needs to do to remind people of his wattage. Yeah, like Valkyrie is sort of a offbeat choice for him, and we'll talk about it later down the road. And it did okay enough at the box office, but it was not not what Tom Cruise is used to, I suppose you should say. No, and I, I mean, people are sort of expecting these big action films from him at this stage. So going back and doing another mission is, is, is right on track. Yeah, and so um, Tom Cruise wanted to work with J.J. Abrams. J.J. Mm -hmm. uh, Abrams was not interested in directing. He would be doing Super 8 instead, but agreed to come back and produce. And so they actually turned to two writers that J.J. Abrams had plenty of experience with, uh, Andre Nemec and Josh Applebaum, who are a writing and producing team, primarily known for their TV work. They started out in the late 90s doing shows like Fame LA, Martial Law, Profiler, Early Edition. And then they wrote seven episodes of Alias and produced 55. So these were Alias vets, kind of like Mission Impossible 3 getting J.J. Abrams the job. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, since uh, Alias, they had worked on Life on Mars and some other TV work. And then they jumped right into Mission Impossible. Um, they have mostly stuck to TV since. They have credits on the two Michael Bay uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles films. But beyond that, it's just TV work. Uh, and they actually recently created the TV series Citadel. Oh, the spy TV series on Amazon, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I never did catch that. But uh, I'd be keen to hear what you guys thought of it. If you did see Citadel, write in and let us know. Is it worth us checking out? Question mark. Did Citadel get a season two? I don't even remember. Well, I, funnily enough, I remember there being this big PR thing with Citadel and like they're going to have multiple different iterations from different countries and different languages and stuff. And then the first season came out and it was just it was like the, the, the air had left the balloon. Right. And it was very expensive, as I recall. Very expensive. It was like, a, wasn't it like a, wasn't that also like the Russo brothers did that or something? I think they may have directed the pilot or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, you, you got to take these punts. You never know. Right. So they put together a script and then they go to Brad Bird, who is a Montana born director, producer, animator, writer. Um, he's pretty much one of the key cogs in the Pixar wheel. People will know him from Incredibles and Ratatouille. Mm -hmm. Incredibles 2 is, of course, as well. And he was someone who was basically like a, a child genius to some degree. Uh, he was 11 years old and got a tour of Walt Disney Studios and was so enamored with their animation work that he began his own animation and was so impressive to Disney that at the age of 14, he was being mentored by Milt Call, who was one of the original Disney Nine Old Men, one of the great animators who put the stamp on Disney animation. Wow. So he was, I mean, I don't want to use the word groomed in a bad way. I mean, in a good way, but yeah. he was sort of groomed for greatness. Yeah, he was. And Disney wow. actually gave him a scholarship to the California Institute of the Arts, uh -huh. where he met Pixar um, co-founder John Lasseter there. And so that's going to lead further down the road into Pixar. But this guy also is um, an animator in the early 80s at Disney. He's working on um, Fox and the Hound, Mickey's Christmas Carol, The Black Cauldron. He is also writing screenplays. He does a couple episodes of Spielberg's Amazing Stories TV show. Uh -huh. He also uh, co-wrote Batteries Not Included, which was that sort of ET-inspired sci-fi film that was... Uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, kind of yeah. a cult favorite. Also, mm -hmm. like in 1990, he directs the Do the Bartman music video, The Simpsons. No. Yes. That's him? That's him. He directed the video. I had that on VHS. Mm -hmm. Wow. I had Brad Bird as a kid. That's right. Yeah. Wow. I feel, I feel old now, somehow. He created the uh, TV series Family Dog in 93, uh, which was one of those shows that came out of the popularity of The Simpsons. Mm -hmm. I think of also like Capital Critters and various shows like that. But in 1999, he writes and directs The Iron Giant, which is a complete box office bomb that goes on to be one of the most beloved animated films of its time. 
It just goes to show people don't know what they want sometimes. I think it was a marketing thing too. I think it was released in like August or something and they just didn't know how to market it. Okay. Uh, I'm glad it's gone on to have a second life. And isn't it also getting remade now? Uh, I don't, I hope not. I don't think so. I don't know. Maybe I misread Stop that. Stop putting that out there, it's... Scott, please. No, no, no more remakes. We're good. Thank you. It is now. No. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. Thanks, Scott. Just in the time ah. it took you to say that sentence, it's been greenlit. Uh. Ah, so in 2004, he, of course, uh, directs and writes The Incredibles. 2007 is Ratatouille. He wins Oscars for both for Best Animated Film. And that leads right into Mission Impossible 4. And he actually had a relationship with J.J. Abrams. They've been talking about working together for quite a while. And he also was a fan of Mission Impossible because he really liked how each film was director-driven. Mm -hmm. It allowed the directors to come in, put their, put their own personal stamps, make unique films. And that's kind of what he wanted to do here. Well, that's interesting because I, I was quite curious looking at his imdb before like i i had known his work you mentioned some of his films but i'd known him as an animation guy so coming in to do this was a bit of a, a pivot but then again this series is known for giving people chances jj was his first time directing a major motion picture yeah and this was brad bird's live action debut as well so, so. yeah hmm. and it was actually a big part of his push was to shoot with imax cameras he wanted to make this look as big as possible and so they go into production, but there's still some script problems. So they bring in a gentleman named Christopher McQuarrie. Oh. Who has, uh, yeah, a writing credit on Valkyrie. So he's worked with Tom Cruise. And he was basically brought in to iron out the mystery elements because they already had their sets. They already had their idea of what they wanted to do in the film. But the mystery was a little bit confusing. And so McQuarrie came in. And we'll talk a lot about him in the future of the franchise. But this is the first steps of Christopher McQuarrie coming in and saving the Mission Impossible day. Uh, well, he's certainly coming in to, uh, to begin to own the franchise. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't... Uh, I, 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 it's, it's always weird, because I always refer to the next four as the Macquarie years. Yeah. But I guess this is the beginning of his, his time. This is sort of the dabbling of coming in, mm -hmm. kind of helping out, and him and Tom Cruise are going to have a relationship that starts in Valkyrie and goes into Jack Reacher mm -hmm. and then a lot of other projects. And so it makes a lot of sense how it evolves into Rogue Nation. Yeah, I, I, I've got my like questions about Macquarie and like his involvement over the years, and uh, because I really love the idea of missions being director led and driven, like you said before, but also like having different visions to them. And I, I tend to find that his films, not in a bad way, but all look like they're from the same person because they are, mm. and that's again not a bad thing. But I do appreciate these first four as a standalone. You know, mm -hmm. they are all very unique. Yeah, Jen, what do you think of the Christopher McQuarrie kind of takeover of the franchise and where it's gone? I I kind of, uh, well, I miss some of the, the wild swings that mm -hmm. this franchise took at the beginning, kind of letting somebody new put their own stamp on it and try new things. Um, the, it definitely became more uniform, and uh, but it's still weird. I mean, Dead Reckoning is, when you watch it, it's very, very weird. Of uh, some of the stuff uh, that goes on in those, it took me a little bit to adapt and see the difference between Ghost Protocol, which seemed much more fun than Rogue Nation. When I went back to back and I watched those, mm -hmm. um, I like Rogue Nation a lot more now. Now that I've kind of seen where the the franchise ended up, um, it's it's a wonderful film. But I there's something about the humor in these movies like that's why you need simon pegg you do need to laugh a little bit and when these films take themselves too seriously i think that's when we run into problems that's why you need in rogue nation the what are you talking about you know the moment where you know you were just dead yes you need these kind of things when you were talking about tom cruise and this period in valkyrie there's one movie you guys didn't mention that's one of my faves from Tom Cruise's. It was a bomb. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me, it's like one of his best movies. It's called Night and Day. And it came out one year before this. Yeah. James Mangold, uh, 2010. It's him and Cameron Diaz. And, you know, it's it's sexy. It's funny. Um, you know, it's it's very it's why we love Tom Cruise. And so I love when these movies indulge that side i think 
this film, I like the team that gets put together in this uh, movie. And I kind of miss that in the next ones. I love the Macquarie one. They're far more professional. They become their own thing. Mm -hmm. But I still do miss, you're not getting Philip Seymour Hoffman zapping people in the head in these new ones. And you're not getting like, just hornier than thou, Brian De Palma, (laughs) or even... Even the second movie gets a little like, come on. And so I do miss that. They are kind of sexless. I love Rebecca Ferguson. I also wish that this series would understand you can have more than two or three women in the series. You don't have to kill one off. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And, uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a revelation the world is not ready for. Put that away, know, Jen. Right? Yes. Bold thinking here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Bring back Paula Patton is what I'm saying. Yes. So you're saying you weren't fanning yourself watching Tom Cruise and Rebecca Ferguson smile at each other on a boat (laughs) in Dead Reckoning? (laughs) (laughs) No, it was wonderful. Yeah. But like, let's bring some other people in too. Yes. I'm all for it. I I, uh, have a lot of questions about that choice in Dead Reckoning, which we'll get into another day. But uh, Cam, get us back to the behind the scenes. Yeah, so Jeremy Renner is cast in this film. And one thing I really noticed going through the old press releases, they kept emphasizing that Jeremy Renner would play an equal role to Tom Cruise in the film. Yeah. And that was something they kept bringing up. And actually, if you go and start, you know, Googling interviews for Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, Jeremy Renner is the one on the press circuit. Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise does not do a lot of interviews. It's Brad Bird doing some and then Jeremy Renner doing lots and lots of interviews. So it's very clear that like... Paramount was using him as a sort of uh, breaking case of emergency situation. Yeah, I agree with you. Also, this comes right after he was nominated two times back to back for supporting actor for her locker in the town. And um, those cruise movies did not do well. And so I wonder if they thought in case. Yeah, we have this guy waiting in the wings. Yep. And yet now we're in a world where Hugh Jackman is still playing Wolverine and probably will keep (laughs) playing Wolverine until he's 90. Yeah, yes. and Jeremy Renner shows up in Rogue Nation in a smaller supporting role and yeah. disappears into the ether, yes. Well, there was mm-hmm. a story that he was meant to come back for either Dead Reckoning or Fallout and get killed in the pre-title sequence, uh, and that would be his third film obligation fulfilled, but he said he didn't want to come back just to get like yeah. just meaninglessly killed, which I'm all for. Like, I, yeah. I, you know, I get, yeah, yeah, for sure. Have him in there. You know, these films are like uh, throw a ton of things at the wall and see what sticks these days anyway. Do a stunt, run around, do a stunt, run around. Why not have Renner in there doing the B story of the film? I've, I've got no problem with it. And I think Dead Reckoning was a bit of a downer for a lot of people, me included. And so I would not be against injecting some life and, and trying again mm-hmm. to get the, uh, the Renner-verse up and going. Yeah, and that was one thing. I think it was Variety said that he would play a role in films going forward. Right. So it wasn't just like, he's coming back to play an equal role to Tom Cruise. It's like, (laughs) he is going to be here forever, folks. Love him. (laughs) Well, there is another universe where Renner was the star of Mission Impossible uh, uh, Rogue Nation. Yeah, like there wasn't, like Tom Cruise could have easily just faded into the background. And 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 the the, Bournes. Yeah. Yeah, he was being groomed for that. Aaron Cross. Yeah. Um, I'm not against him coming back for a Bourne film either. But, you know, we don't live in that universe, but I I think he's a a good addition to this film, which we'll get into. Yeah, definitely. Um, Another interesting little tidbit was they were considering dropping the word Mission Impossible, or the two words, from the title, because the third one had not performed what they, you know, expected. And so they were thinking of going inspired by The Dark Knight Uh... with maybe just a standalone title like Ghost Protocol, for example. But ultimately, they realized branding was too important. Mm-hmm. Also, like Batman has a certain iconography that if you put the cowl on a poster, you don't need to say Batman. It says Batman. Whereas I'm not quite sure what Tom Cruise with slightly like mid length hair is. Yeah. Or Ghost Protocol, people would think it's a sci fi movie. Yeah. 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 And I mean, The Dark Knight, people, you know, some people know as Batman's like nickname or the Cape Crusader, one or the other. Yeah. Is there a term that says Mission Impossible without using the two words <laughs> Mission Impossible? Ethan Hunt? I don't know. Oh, no. Uh, Mission Impossible Origins, Ethan Hunt, yeah. is not a film I want to see. No. no, no. So this film had a budget of $145 million, 
domestically it did 209.4, international 485.3 for a worldwide total of 694.7, which makes it the highest grossing Mission Impossible film at this point in time. The closest competition was the second one, which did 546.4. I imagine adjusted for inflation, they're probably a bit closer to each other. Yeah, and this did almost 300 million more than part three. Yeah, I... I wonder what it. I mean, we did discuss this with Scott Manson in the third one. I, I, there were a lot of things going against that film, and probably some good reasons why it didn't do well. So I'm glad this one found its footing. Yeah, and it seems like it was a much easier production because with three, there were so many permutations, different directors jumping on and off. This one was much smoother. Um, and uh, yeah, so it landed at number five for the year between Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn, Part One, Ooh. and Kung Fu Panda 2. Um, I can't help but wonder, too, if a bit of the box office was bumped by the fact that they had the preview footage from The Dark Knight Rises, which was hugely awaited. You've, if you went and saw this movie in IMAX, you got the plane sequence from the start of Dark Knight Rises. Oh, I think I must have seen this in IMAX then, because I definitely remember seeing that clip. Yeah, and that's where all the complaints came that no one could understand Bane initially. And then they, they like slightly bumped up his volume. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do a Bane impression on this episode. I, I can't I can't bring you all to that. That's not that's not good. Uh, no, well, I, 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 as I say, I'm glad this film found its audience. And I think it's uh, the, the right film. It's probably why the Goldfinger analogy comes up quite a lot. Because, you know, Goldfinger is kind of like the blueprint for Bond. Maybe some people think this is a blueprint for, for Mission because this is the one that got them on track. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so the top three for the year. Number one was Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows Part 2. Number two, Transformers Dark of the Moon. And number three, Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. That is a, uh, uh, two of those are pretty rough. Uh, and just a final Franchise. note. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just a final note, uh, Brad Bird followed this up with Tomorrowland in 2015, which was a movie he used a lot of his clout to get made. It was uh, not great, not great. But um, that the Tom Hanks film? Uh, no, it was George, George Clooney. Clooney. George Clooney. Yeah. I never saw it. I just heard like so many bad things about it. I gave it a miss. It's ambitious. Worth watching? Uh, I don't know. What do you think, Jen? I can't accurately say I saw it once and didn't make a big impression. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Tomorrow didn't land. Yeah. It did not. No. Uh, but it was announced actually yesterday at the time of recording that he's coming back to write and direct Incredibles three. Okay. Okay, they're going back for more, are they? They are indeed. Yeah. And we're getting Toy Story six, five, five. Sorry, is it five? Wow uh franchises again it feels like six yeah uh, yeah was is there like a film in there that i'm just making up as a fifth one or is it just all those toy story shorts maybe i'm putting together in my head there's been a lot of shorts yeah, yeah. like toys of terror and stuff like that the one with condor man which is always worth mm -hmm. watching yeah uh i think forky got a short yeah sure <laughs> sure short yeah all right, well, it's time to finally accept our mission and talk about MI4, MI Ghost Protocol, Ghost Protocol, or whatever you'd like to call it. I, I saw one of the, I was watching some videos, some of the premieres, and there was a really cool, one of the foreign titles was Phantom Protocol, Ooh, which I just thought. I like that. That sounds, that sounds pretty cool too, actually, Phantom mm -hmm. Protocol. Maybe I'll refer to it as that. That reminds me of uh, when I was in Disneyland Paris, and they called their haunted mansion Phantom Manor. Oh, that's uh, that yeah. sounds scary. Cool. Yeah. yeah, just sounds good too. It does. But let's talk about it, Jen. You're our guests. Guests always go first. You've revisited the film for the show. You obviously loved it when you first saw it. How do you feel about it now? Oh, I still love it. It is my favorite one of the series. It's hard to know where the next one would be. I think I ranked them at one point. Maybe Fallout would be right after this, but. Um, my goodness, I, I love the team. I love, uh, like I said, the, the creativity, the fact that you know you're in really good uh, cinematic hands. I think um, maybe because, I mean, J.J. Abrams, super talented guy, but maybe because that was his first one and he was a little, like you said, directors coming and going, lots of maybe too many cooks. I feel like Brad Bird, you could tell, really 
knew his framing and his blocking and like the beats and the, this is what we're going to do the visual scope of this film um yesterday when i was recording an episode on carol reed's movies with a good friend he was saying one of the things he loves so much about the movies like odd man out and even man between is just taking big sets and letting your characters walk through them you know don't really cheap out on production design or even if you're using practical effects uh and you really get a sense of space like the kremlin sequence Mm. is the kremlin sequence you're not gonna um you know he runs into a dust storm which of course i love because we have dust storms here all the time and um just the sense of visual audacity it isn't just stunt after stunt after stunt um everything looks different from sequence to sequence but it's all cohesive it comes together i i love this film yeah i I can't get this image out of my head now of you like walking around your neighborhood and just climbing up buildings just pretending Mm. you're you're climbing the burj khalifa waiting for a sandstorm (laughs) to come along yeah Uh, yeah that's just what you do in phoenix right yeah pass the time somehow sure exactly some people golf here I climb buildings. Yeah. <laughs> right. Spider Gen, I guess we'll call you from now on. There you go. I, it's, it's crazy. Like, I, I don't think I've ever sat down and thought, like, what's my definitive favorite Mission Impossible film? We probably will do that on the show at some point. But this is your favorite Mission Impossible film. That's, that's, mm-hmm. that's really interesting. And, and you've obviously gone back and rewatched them all since. This is really like oh, you several picked times. your favorite. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think you're right, though. Like, this is a, a, a visual splendor of a film, Mm -hmm. which is crazy from someone coming from animation. You think there'd be a a, a rocky transition, you know, because animation's a very different beast when it comes to directing. And like, this is a very, you're filming things. You've got to get it right in the lens. You can't just go back and like erase it with a a magic marker or anything like that. Yes. And so, yeah. And and like the sequences do look different. The Kremlin feels different to when you're in Dubai and it feels different Mm -hmm. to when you're in like San Francisco, wherever that is right at the end. And yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I think Brad Bird does himself a, a service. And I think it's a shame we haven't seen more of him doing live action films. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned the transition from animation into live action. His colleague, Andrew Stanton, was doing the same thing at the point in time he's making uh, Ghost Protocol. And Andrew Stanton makes John Carter, mm-hmm. which is an incredibly expensive disaster. And yeah. he hasn't gone back to live action. And then Brad Bird has Tomorrowland. So it seems like it is often very difficult to venture outside of that. And there have been other animators that have also attempted, like Chris McKay is out there working now. Um, but they often can't replicate the genius. And I think Brad Bird comes the closest we've seen in recent years. Yeah, Chris McKay has been on my show um, a couple times. He's wonderful. He's actually going to do something pretty against type i think it's supposed to be kind of a sexy movie next so i'm I'm excited for that one yeah okay well speaking of uh sexy why don't i throw it over to myself to talk about what i think of the film (laughs) oh i thought that was cueing me scott oh (laughs) oh no i was i was was leading you on there to see if you think it was for you (laughs) yeah 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 i uh i went into this one like wanting to pick it apart for some reason, I, I like I really loved going back to Mission Impossible three, and I I like my my thoughts on Mission Impossible two went down a little bit from revisiting it, and so I thought like maybe this isn't as good as I remember it being, but it is. It's it's great. There is a reason why people point to this film and say this is where they they righted the ship and just they got the chemistry correct. They figured out how the team dynamics work. Mm-hmm. They figured out the beats of a Mission Impossible film, and it really is like maybe this isn't mission at its best for me personally like i i think there's probably one or two i would put above if i had to list them but this is so easy to watch it's two hours and like 11 minutes i think that just go by in a flash there's no there's no dead weight on this it is lean mean tom cruise is in fighting form he's got his mission impossible 2 hair back which i am so thankful for (laughs) as a follically challenged man i'm always happy to see a man with long hair it's great stuff uh, but like all of like the people that have appeared for the first time in here, Paul the Patton, Jeremy Renner, doing great jobs here, and they've given Simon Pegg more to do. They realized that they had struck gold in Mission Impossible Three and gave yeah. him more stuff. And he's great. He's like the the levity in the film. He just like, and it's not too much. He's, he's not throwing jokes out every second. It's like just enough to make you kind of smile, and then you go into you know climbing the Burj Khalifa. And and that's the other thing is the stunts. This is really where like the stunts kick off. 
mm-hmm. in the mission films. This is the first big stunt. You could say like the the bridge scene in in three, or like the knife in two are pretty big, or like the uh, the heist in one. But climbing that monument, it was absolutely huge. And they would go on to do similarly like huge stunts with the plane in the next one, stuff like that going forward. So yeah, I mean, overall takeaway, maybe it's not my top favorite, but good God, is it a good film. Yeah, I think of like the mountain climbing at the start of part two as maybe like mm-hmm. the first big stunt. I was just going to say that. Yes. But it's like the movie didn't realize that that was a big stunt because they're just playing it over the credits. Yeah. And it's like, oh, like, they didn't quite realize this could be a set piece and really like suck the audience in. But it's important because it's actually backstory that's needed when he climbs the Burj Khalifa. Yep. It's very true. Yeah. This movie does actually a really good job of sprinkling in Ethan Huntisms yeah. throughout the entire series. You know, you get the close up magic. You get in this one, he's doing the lip reading, uh, which we saw in three. Uh, he's dr- yeah. doing drawings on his hand just to establish that he's a very good artist. Um, there's all these little bits they carry on throughout the series. That, uh, could I just jump in? Yes. I, I've got a bugbear about that hand drawing. <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of i will say that's a little funny to me it's insane i mean like 10 seconds he draws like a masterpiece on his hand and he expects jeremy renner to recognize him from like this sweaty palm drawing like yeah. poor guy this he must be the best analyst going to be like oh yeah that's so and so that's yeah. great i mean uh, stretching believability just a little bit i'll take him climbing the Burj khalifa but a hand drawing mm. The jokey version of that scene is like the funniest looking drawing of like a face on his <laughs> that hand. That would like be a, funny. Like <laughs> a yeah. stick man. Like, yeah, exactly. Do you recognize this man. guy? That's like the Naked Gun version. Uh, maybe we can get that in yeah. the Naked Gun remake they're going to do with Liam Neeson. Um, but uh, the word that I took from this movie is just playful. Mm-hmm. And that's something that doesn't really apply to the previous three. Because the third one has a little more of like a grit to it. Whereas like yep. this yeah. one... It just feels like it wants to have fun at all times. And it's, yes, end of the world stakes, but it feels like it's really embracing comic book energy in a way we haven't really seen. And it, you can see it in all of the set pieces, which are just incredible. But it's also just like the characters. And it seems like Brad Bird cares more about the supporting cast of a Mission Impossible film than we've ever seen before. One of my biggest complaints, actually, with the third one was with the team, Jonathan Reese myers and Maggie Q., they're fun, mm-hmm. but you don't really get a whole lot out of them other than like mm-hmm. a, nope. talking about praying over a cat. Uh, it was just kind of like this weird little se- section you got of them sitting in a car. Whereas, you know, Simon Pegg doesn't really have a huge motivation in the movie, but we understand the excitement. He's kind of, he's us. Yep. He's getting to go hang out with Tom Cruise on a mission. But both Paula Patton and Jeremy Renner have legit motivations like guiding them through the entire story that yeah. you are tracking beginning, middle, and end. You have heart to hearts with Tom Cruise, uh, his character, Ethan Hunt, about what they are going through emotionally. Mm-hmm. I don't think we've seen anything like this before. You can point to the early, you know, like the De Palma film, where there's definitely things going on there with Emmanuel Bier, mm-hmm. but like a lot of that is obscured. Whereas here, you are watching characters who live and breathe and are actually carrying weight over the course of a journey. Well, we all like said that Mission Impossible 3 was probably the most character driven of the Mission Impossible films with, with Scott Matz in the previous episode. And I, th- I think that still holds true. Yeah. But I, I think Brad Bird and the writers are still taking some of those nuggets forward in this because these do feel like fully fleshed out characters. And it's quite amazing that the film actually makes Jeremy Renner feel close to Ethan Hunt. Mm-hmm. Maybe not mm-hmm. full Ethan Hunt because a, a different film like you're bringing in a protege could easily be like, oh, this guy. Mm-hmm. You know, like, oh, he's here to take my job, blah, blah, blah. But they give him hero moments. They give him the jump at the end with the magnets. Like, they didn't have to do that. Mm-hmm. And there was a there was a rewrite uh, that Christopher McQuarrie did that I was reading about earlier where like originally it was meant to be Renner that kills uh, the guy in the office space at the end. Right. So they can turn the generators back on, the, the server back on. But then they gave it to Benji, so he gets his sort of complete, kind of an arc of like becoming a field agent. He got a kill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a great change. Like, you know, Renner is given so much of the spotlight. You could tell they like wanted to have that ripcord built into the film. And they could have easily like played him off as second fiddle to Cruz, but they did everything in their power to make him look just as good. Definitely. And I mean, you can almost see a little bit in the Jeremy Renner character of the Tom Cruise character in the first film, Mm -hmm. where you see a little more of that intensity. He's a little more buttoned up, more of a company man. Mm -hmm. And that has kind of changed over the course of the Mission Impossible franchise. But you can see that in Jeremy Renner at the start, 
So it almost feels like you're kind of kickstarting a parallel kind of journey for that character. And also as the kind of Tom Cruise rehabilitation project that this movie kind of was, he is so much fun in this movie. And I think one of the smartest things they do is play up how good he is at comedy. Whether it's the prison break sequence with the another kick in the head where he wants to go into the uh, the room that is locked off and he's just sitting there staring at the camera, you know, sending hand signals to Benji and then looking at the guards or rolling his eyes. Yeah, the honeymooners. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. yeah. Like that stuff is great. Or I love seeing almost like nervous Tom Cruise, the closest we'll ever see to nervous Tom Cruise before going outside of the Burj Khalifa. Yes. When he's like, like, I don't want to do this. Like, I like seeing that. And also, like, playing it as sort of inelegant. When he goes to swing back through the glass, he conks his head and flips backwards out of the window. Mm -hmm. Like, they are definitely having fun with Tom Cruise in this movie in a way where I feel like in the past they play him a little more statuesque. Well, he's kind of, like, perfect in some of the films. MI2 specifically, like, he doesn't do a, a thing wrong, whereas this is still a, a fallible guy. Like, he is doing these amazing things, but he will still bang his head on stuff. That's, mm -hmm. that's just natural. We all would do it. I don't think I'd make that jump there at the Burj Khalifa. I can't imagine climbing out that window. Like, you couldn't even get me to do that with all the cables in the world. Well, you recently went skydiving, Cam. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you've, you've kind of plummeted to the earth, so you know what that sensation is like. So I think you'd actually be better at climbing because you wouldn't want to experience that again. There is a difference between climbing on something versus just rolling out of a plane. Yeah. Someone else is controlling. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fair. That's fair. But it sounds like it's a bit of a love fest here, which I like to hear. A, a, a lot of ghosts in this protocol. Let's talk about likes and you know specify some things that we really enjoy. So, Jen, I'm going to throw it to you first. Just some of the things, maybe a specific thing you want to talk about or a couple of the broader things that you really liked about this film. Um, I think I've talked about some of them. I think the chemistry uh, is really good. Renner and Peg together are fabulous. Like, later on, you get... Peg and Ving Rhames, they're okay together, but there's something about, especially uh, when the Khalifa thing is happening, like the way that they interact is really, really good. I think Paula Patton, um, she gets some really interesting things to do. This is kind of a tough franchise on female yeah. characters, and I feel like it's interesting that she gets to have been a handler and a love of the man who gets killed right at the beginning. I think just some of the man against the world, like they're using some of the building blocks, I feel like, of spy movies, what we love, like when he has to climb out of the building to escape right after the Kremlin in, uh, scene. I think that is really clever. So there's like, stakes i think what you were saying about him bumping into stuff during that dust storm like he flies onto the car because he's hit by a car so you do see him kind of having to roll with the punches i like all of that i think yeah i i can probably repeat myself by talking about those elements ain't that a kick in the head i think is <laughs> maybe my favorite thing in this entire franchise i have to say I mean, I, I, I live for any time Dean Martin appears in a spy movie. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, you know, he had four films as Matt Helm in the 60s. It wasn't enough. Nope. Bring him back. Uh, yeah, I'm all... I, I, I'd forgotten this song was in the film. So as soon as I heard that first like beat, I was like, oh my God, Dean Martin's in this film. This is fantastic. I was going <laughs> to mention, uh, you mentioned Paula Patton there. And she is one of my favorite moments in the movie, which is with the Leia Sadu assassin character. Yes. And you get that whole great sequence where they have the meetings going on in separate rooms, yeah. which is incredibly suspenseful and fun and very playful. Again, you know, you got Simon Pegg's with the fake hand. But like, there's the moment where she's on the run and Paula Patton, it just cuts to her going, I'm on it. And she's like pulling off her yes. high heels and she's in like linebacker mode. And you're just like, whoa, like watch out. <laughs> Yeah, because he, he keeps repeating Cruz over the, you know, like, tell me she's an asset, Jane, like, you know, and he, she will not confirm that she got that order. And um, she does bring her in and then you see her hands shaking. And I like that very much. And then later, uh, I like when they're kind of freaking out on each other. Why not just throw her out a window? <laughs> and uh, Yeah, that's all good, too. Essentially, one of the other things I've forgotten about this film was Leia Sadu is in it. Obviously, she's yeah. going to be in two Bond films later on. 
And then uh, she gets to be kicked out of the window in the Burj Khalifa, which is a pretty cool way to be killed in, in a spy movie. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is like pretty early in her crossover into American films because I think it was just the year before she did Ridley Scott's Robin Hood. And I think that was the first place I ever saw her. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, she's gone on to uh, spy infamy now, as, as some would point her as the reason why James Bond is in smithereens on an island somewhere. But uh, I'll let those people argue with each other online. Uh, for me, I think like some of the things I want to highlight, I mean, we've spoken about the cast. We could get more specific, but I think just some great casting all around. I think I, I think bringing Jeremy Renner in was a great idea. And I think I think the Mission franchise is, is maybe lost out a little bit by not having him in all mm -hmm. the films are going forward. I think there was probably there was space for him. Agreed. Yeah, he's very funny in this. One of the funniest moments in the movie is when he has to do the jump. Yeah. Hilarious. And Simon Pegg is like, ah, oh, just do it, just do it, just do it. And he's like doing stretches and trying to psych himself up. Like I like that they let that moment just be prolonged because it works really well for the character. Yeah, the jacket, then the tie, <laughs> then mm. the and how he starts and then he doesn't, and then yeah, it's great. I think you get an animated, an animation director is the one that would keep prolonging that. Somebody, I think, more dialogue oriented would be like, well, come on, come on. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this movie is confident. It, like, it'll let it sit. You know, it'll let, yes. it'll just sit with a character for a prolonged period of time. Yeah. Yeah. If you uh, if you want an idea of what Cam was actually like in the airplane before he jumped out for his skydive, <laughs> just watch the Jeremy Renner scene before he does the jump. That's basically it. Well, uh, <laughs> behind the scenes story, actually, both my friend and I did videos on the skydive. And so if you look at my friend's video, you can actually see me in the background looking like grim death, just staring at the wall of the plane. So uh, it's not present on my video, but on his video, it's given away. It's just heavy, heavy breathing on your video. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, a lot of heavy breathing. Uh, I mean, th the other thing I want to call out, I mean, I... I... I could talk about the Burj Khalifa. Maybe I'll leave that. I think actually the one of the things that jumped out to me was Michael Giacchino's score mm -hmm. for this one. Just mm -hmm. it's not very often a score jumps out to me as being something as like a bonus point to the film, like I like. But this it just was right in all the right places. It was it was subtle when it needed to be and loud when it needed to be. And Michael Giacchino is a guy who's usually knocks it out of the park. And I've just heard he's like a snippet of his Fantastic Four score, which actually sounds really nice too. But yeah, I just think he was a great guy to have on. And uh, I think this is his second and last of the Mission films. Um, that's okay. right. Yeah. And he'd actually worked on the Incredible scores, which right. were what really blew him up as mm -hmm. well. So uh, you can understand how he would come over with Brad Bird on this. But it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like he's repeating the Mission Impossible 3 score. No, no, it's definitely an evolution. And, and one of the things that, you know, tying into what Jen said, like it, having the sort of travel log feel to it. There's a lot of locations in this uh, film and he actually leans into that in his, in the music and it's also not too like heavy on leaning into it. There is like motifs and hints in the music from the different sections and areas in the world but it's not obnoxious. No, no, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, but what about you, Cam? I like. One of my favorite things about this movie is the way it's kind of tied together with this theme of technology failing. And we see it right early on with the phone, you know, the this message will self-destruct or the phone doesn't go off. Yes. That continues through the entire film. You have the mask maker breaking mm -hmm. down. You have Ethan Hunt on the Burj Khalifa with the glove that, you know, breaks down. He lets lets it go. And then it's stuck to the glass a moment later. And it makes that funny sound as it's falling, which mm -hmm. feels like the most animation moment of the entire movie. But like this continues through the whole film. And it does two things. It establishes the importance of the teamwork, that ultimately it's about humans pulling these things off. It's not about technology. Yeah. But also, it builds high, high suspense for the Jeremy Renner sequence. Because the entire film, technology has gone horribly awry. And now Jeremy Renner is being told to dive off into a turbine, uh, you know, and just pray that this rover thing works. And so it also amps up the attention there. I think it's really smart. And I don't know if there's another Mission Impossible film that really, like takes a facet of the TV show and finds a way to kind of work it into a theme. No, I can't think there is a one either. I, I will just uh, mention tying into TV show nods. The wonderful bit of tech used in the Kremlin infiltration is actually taken from the TV show. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. I can't remember the episode uh, title, but they do a projection like in a hallway thing to confuse a, a, a guard and they do the whole setup as well. I, I just think it's a nice callback. I wonder if that's the writers or if that's a Brad Bird call. 
well, I really love that screen sequence because A, it just looks really cool, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. B, it's not perfect. No. You see Simon Pegg's face pop up on it. Yeah. You can like feel that there's this could go wrong at any moment and suddenly you have two people looking at it. It's glitching back and forth. Uh, it's like the fact that they're using technology that looks cool on screen, but also acknowledging its limitations, I think is really smart. Like the contact lens that makes the copy that scrambles the the code. I think that's really good too. If it's off by a fraction or it's noticeable. Yeah. And that of course also sets up dead reckoning with technology. Beware of tech has kind of been going through these movies. Yeah. Is this the first instance of Tom Cruise fighting against technology for the future of movies? Oh, uh, could you give us some other examples apart from dead reckoning? <sighs> No, not off the top of my head. I just think of this movie, like so much of it is sold on the Burj Khalifa sequence, which is Tom Cruise hanging from a cable on this, you know, doing that actual stunt. Yeah. Um, it's on the cover of the Blu-ray. It was heavily marketed. It's on the poster. And the whole movie is about how technology will fail you. Mm. But Tom Cruise on a cable, that will always sell. Tom Cruise will never let you down. That's right. That's right. Mm. He won't, Scott. That is the takeaway message of this film. Hire Tom Cruise, please. Put him in more <laughs> films. I, I, I think we can't let the likes section pass without just taking a moment to talk a little bit more about the Burj Khalifa. One of the biggest issues I had with Dead Reckoning is the motorcycle jump. I think it looked fantastic, but I like I seeing all those behind the scenes videos and like the ramp that was then turned into a mountain and stuff like that. It just took a tiny bit of the magic away from me from seeing like how the sausage was made. Mm. I didn't see any behind the scenes stuff for the Burj Khalifa before I saw the film. I just saw the film and like my jaw hit the floor. I know there was safety wires used and you know all that sort of stuff to make sure it was just about safe, not too safe. But like that just felt like a man taking the film into his own hands. It, I think it was probably where he became more like Buster Keaton. Yeah, and I remember too, like Mission Impossible 3 was heavily sold on the image of the missile going off and Tom Cruise being hit, you know, against mm -hmm. the side of the car. Yep. And it's a great shot and it worked on me, you know, when I saw it in theaters, it still does, but I was quicker to acknowledge it as a really great example of effects versus like the Burj Khalifa. I like that, you know, that feeling in the pit of my stomach watching it in the theater. And I never got to see it in IMAX. I wish I had of, but I can only imagine the vertigo that would have been induced from watching that. And that's something you're going to see, obviously, very heavily in Fallout in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I just think, like, if this is the... Like, if anyone made a list of the best Mission Impossible stunts, it, this easily has to be in the top three. I don't hold it against the movie at all, but it almost hurts having it in the middle because you can never top it in this film. Oh, as in you have it at the end almost, so like you build and build and build to it. I don't know that I would. I'm just saying like when you look at the structure of the movie, you go from having this in the middle to having the automated car park um, at the end. It just feels like these are two different things. No, I, I, I certainly see it. And I think um, just in terms of other likes, I did briefly mention it earlier. I, I'm all here for the hair. <laughs> like we we tom cruise needs to have that hair when he's ethan hunt like i he loses it later films as well the short he has a short hair in mission impossible 3 i'm all about that mi2 and 4 hair let it go scott let it go uh, i wish i could we interrupt this program to bring you a special report red alert spy hards we are shaking things up over on the patreon page that's right, we are launching an exclusive new show where we tackle the exploits of the small screen's greatest secret agents like Jack Bauer, George Smiley, and beyond. And don't forget, every month you also get two Agents in the Field episodes where we decode the adventures of your favorite spy actors in their biggest non-spy movies. But Cab, tell the people what we have coming up next. Sad but true, fall is fast approaching, so why not catch up on our August offerings over on the Spy Hearts Patreon? Check out our reviews on Waterworld and Godzilla 1998, plus, of course, the 1989 Get Smart Again TV movie. What more could you ever ask for? So strap on your Condor Man wings and soar into the future with us over at patreon.com slash spyhearts. But before Big O zaps us with a red pulsating laser, 
let's get back to the spy jinx. All right, well, let's take it over to dislike. Snow film can be utter perfection, though we, we do wish they were. Mission Impossible 4. Jen, what do you think about uh, any of the dislikes of the film? Any, any sort of things you could criticize? I don't really know off the top of my head, except the films that would come later. I'd be like, wait a minute, where, where are these missing uh, members of the team, essentially? But that's it's not really... Maybe more Luther. We should have had Luther a little bit. Like he shows up at the end. One like, I guess, that I forgot. Um, so maybe it'd be a, a dislike that she isn't in it more. I loved that Michelle Monaghan um, mm, sure. does make an appearance at the end. So I think um, I like the ambiguity and not knowing what happened with Julia. I think that was clever, but it would have been interesting to maybe work in a couple little more questions about that earlier on possibly though i did hear that one of the reasons they hired macquarie is because the movie was too complicated and convoluted and it was confusing people a little bit um yeah that could be i think trying to think what what a negative would well, be and you I, have one there with, with yeah. luther like i mean the the team they assembled was great yes but it, it you actually don't realize you're missing luther until you see him at the end and then you're like mm. oh he could have been great in here yeah I, I have to imagine that was just like a maybe a timing thing like he wasn't available to shoot the rest of the film is this like the least amount of time you see luther in a mission film yes um i I don't know the actual hard facts on this one. I have seen people online theorize that he was busy shooting Kojak at that point. Okay. He's doing the TV reboot of that, maybe. Um, to me, like, Bing Rames is just an indelible part of the franchise. And I remember yeah. being a little bummed he wasn't a bigger role. Yeah. But obviously, they realized that, too, because you look at the films going forward. Luther is... He kind of like ascends to being like the the soul of the franchise. You get to like the later ones, and he's the one always doling out advice and wisdom. So you're like, okay, they obviously realized why they needed him. I also wonder at this point in time if they're looking at it on paper, going, well, Benji's a hacker. What do we do with Luther? Yeah, and possibly had they had Luther in, we would have had maybe too many conversations between him and Tom Cruise about like emotional romantic life because he is the one who knows him the best and so he would have talked about julia and so maybe it would have been like what are we having him talk about yeah excellent point yeah because he could have cleared up all of the yep. um journey that minutes. jeremy renner is going on yeah yeah hmm. i mean he, he did get the one of the best bits in the film where he teases uh ethan hunt on saying mission accomplished yes <laughs> <laughs> which is a great bit yeah, it's a great bit, and he's yeah. probably one of the only people that can get away with actually like sticking it to Ethan Hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, for my dislike, and it's something I kind of teased early on, and that yeah. is the, the, the villains of the film, or the, specifically Hendrix, the villain himself. I mean, it's a, it's a gargantuan task coming off of Philip Seymour Hoffman in the third film. Like, how do, you, how do you live up to that? Yeah. How do you come close to that? Maybe you just don't try. Maybe that's what he was going for. And I don't want to speak ill of uh, Michael, is it Nyquist? Is that yeah. how you pronounce it? Yeah. I mm. mean, he's he's passed on since the film was made. Um, but I and, and maybe it's to do with the scripting. But there's like a scene in the film during the sandstorm, which we spoke about earlier, where you think you're chasing his henchman, uh, who is a Leonid, uh, is the character apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, or no, Winstrom, sorry. It's Winstrom. Winstrom. Uh, and then he does the, the face mask reveal and you find out mm -hmm. that it is Nyquist's Hendrix and it just like doesn't land you, you almost forget like oh that is the villain oh right um and I just think that's a real shame of this film that there wasn't anyone that was close enough to go toe to toe to Ethan Hunt I would go as far as to say this guy ranks lower than Doug Ray Scott from Mission Impossible 2 when it comes to <laughs> Mission Impossible villains oh uh I feel like they were trying something different with this guy, mm -hmm. which is like, you don't really know who he is. He's just this like mysterious character they're pursuing. Yeah. Um, I almost wonder if they gave him too many scenes where he's actually featured. Like they should have just played him as someone who's always around the periphery of the movie. There's a point actually when they first show up at the Kremlin, he's out of focus in the foreground, yeah. like darting off camera. 
And I'm like, maybe they should have just gone that angle. Like, had him just someone who's always kind of occupying the background or moving throughout the film. So you have to track him down. Um, because it feels a little weird to give him minimal screen time. You don't know anything about him other than he's like a nuclear terrorist. Yep. And then you have him going like toe to toe in a fight with Tom Cruise at the end. Yeah. Or else they could have made Leah Sadu's character like more. Um, I guess she could have been like villain number one and then something. Well, I feel yeah. like you know more about her. And yeah, sort of exactly. Like her moral code by the end of the film than you do about him. I, I'm not even entirely sure what he wants to do with the weapon he's trying to find. Like, he wants to blow somewhere up, but I don't even know what that end goal was. Whereas you knew, like, Philip Seymour Hoffman was just a baddie. Like, and, and he had a mission, but, it, like, Ethan just interfered with his stuff. That's all it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can track that back to, like, two, where Doug Ray wanted the weapon to control the world, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, I just think, like, I'm not saying you should try and do Philip Seymour Hoffman version two. It doesn't have to be that big, but I think, yeah, if if you were to ask me who is the least memorable mission villain, I would have always have said Doug Ray Scott until revisiting this. Like he's clearly an extremist because he's willing to commit suicide sure. mm-hmm. to pull off this, you know, missile um hit. Uh-huh. And I mean, I like that sequence where he's just laying there and you see his eye watching Ethan Hunt as he, succeeds in stopping it and just closing i I like that they give that character that moment of final failure but Mm -hmm. there is just something about the way he kind of just is underdeveloped purposely so that i can understand why people find him frustrating uh it's notable to me like vladimir uh, vladimir mashkov shows up as like uh russian intelligence who's pursuing ethan hunt throughout the film Mm -hmm. and he's way more memorable like that's a character that really sticks with me has memorable moments and they either should have given uh, Cobalt a scene or two like that more or pulled back on him, I think. Yeah, it, I, I just think like if you're going to do a mission film, you need to have a strong antagonist as well as a, a strong protagonist. And this is just not, not reaching that barrier, that level for me. Uh, what about you, Cam, a dislike? Well, I was going to ask, what if they just not shown him at all until the very end because they don't know who he is? And you have the moment where we're in the sandstorm, Tom Cruise crashes the cars together and pulls the rubber mask off the guys and realizes that he was wearing a mask so you don't know what he looks like the entire film and then you reveal at the end maybe that would have been more effective i can answer that and i can tell you exactly what audiences would have thought about you can't do that with this actor yeah if you did it with like brad pitt Mm. then people go oh Oh, like Brad Pitt's the villain? Wow. Yeah. But you just do like a, a, a an actor, a character actor who's you know very popular in a lot of films in his time when he was working it and still with us. I'm not sure he has the same like grab. No, that, that's like, true. Brad Pitt or Robert Downey Jr., whoever you want to pull out. Like, I just think that's, if you're going to go that route, you need a bigger name. Yeah, he hasn't done John Wick yet. Um, no. He would have had the Millennium Trilogy. Uh, so... But that's only going to be select audiences. And I, I think, uh, you know, Jen brought up Carol Reed earlier. And had you had like an Orson Welles <laughs> like celebrity show up mm-hmm. at the end, that hits with audiences. But yeah, um, not the case here. No, no. But if throwing it back to you, Cam, what do you think of dislikes? I don't have a lot. But the one that stood to me was that um, this movie really works best when it's celebrating practical action and set pieces Mm -hmm. there are some cg sequences in this that are a little dodgy now and i think of the bombing of the kremlin yeah um where you have the explosion and tom cruise trying to outrun it and also some of the sandstorm stuff that just it it has aged quite poorly and it looks like cg cloud and you can tell a lot of this movie was actually shot in vancouver um i don't know if people know that but a lot of it was green screens in vancouver and those are the sequences primarily that jump out to me it's it's interesting you mentioned the Kremlin explosion and and the sandstorm. They both those scenes together both remind me of uh, the Dark Knight Rises when the football stadium explodes, yeah. which always stood out to me as a pretty bad looking bit of CG. Hmm. Um. I mean, they did the best they could with that, but yeah, th- those two don't hold up very well. And I watched this in 4K, and it doesn't doesn't do it any favors. No, and like the automated car lot at the end, which was shot like five minutes from my house, um. Like, that sequence is heavy CG, but it works. Like, I buy it as a practical place, whereas, like, some of those other effects, they just kind of have that CG swirl look. Is is that car lot actually by your house, or is it just a building they use <laughs> instead? 
<laughs> it's just a warehouse by the waterfront. <laughs> oh, uh, that's less exciting. Yeah, but, I, uh, I think right. we all deserve a photo op outside of it now. So you've set yourself up for that. Well, a lot of the Mumbai stuff was actually Vancouver. Like the, they're even out in front of like where they have the big party is just like across the water here. Well, that's the the the, the city slogan that the Mumbai of Canada, right? That's what we're known as. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, yeah, it, it, it's interesting that there was definitely far more likes than dislikes. I think that sort of lends us to where we're perhaps going with the knock list later on. But I'd be remiss if we didn't just do like final notes, uh, anything we've missed or want to go back and tackle. I've got a couple, but Jane, is there anything you've missed you want to just bring up about Mission Impossible 4? I can't think of anything, no. Okie dokie. Um, Cam, what about you? Um, we have the teasing of the syndicate at the end of this yeah. movie. Which... Yeah, yeah. Caught me by surprise because normally this fil- this series isn't known for its um, ongoing serialization. And so the fact you had that being set up and then Macquarie coming in with Rogue Nation to carry that forward, I thought was actually kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't remember that being in it at all. That has to be a Macquarie thing being added in, mm-hmm. in the script later on. Uh, and obviously they were going to play a big part in the next two films. So I, I, I don't... And they... It's interesting because a lot of these films have been quite self-contained. This does sort of lend to there being a wider world in the mission films. Yeah, no, I agree. And I also like that sequence where he goes, Tom Cruise's character goes and meets with the arms dealer, Ilya Volok, as The Fog, which is a great name. Um, Mm -hmm. But like that character, he's just a completely random character, but he brings like so much gravitas to that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Like you feel like this is a guy who has seen and done things and when he's basically saying, this doesn't work to your best interests, I really like that character. Yeah. And, you know, a franchise now, you'd see that character in every movie. For sure. would be like, oh, he worked. Bring him back. Bring him back. And I kind of like that he's this one standalone, one scene character. Yeah, I, I completely love that. And I think that uh, lends to one of the notes I had, which is the callback in this film to Mission Impossible 1. Mm-hmm. The uh, the fog you mentioned the fog. Well, his contact is the same chap from Mission Impossible One and also the Living Daylights. I'm going to butcher the name, but Andreas Wisniewski, I okay. believe, who played Necros in the Living Daylights. He was also the sort of handler for uh, I can't remember the name of the lady, but one of the villains in Mission Impossible One. Okay. Oh, Max. Yeah, he, he he's a handler for Max. He has big, long, blonde hair. And then he also appears in this one, too, as a handler for someone else. It's nice that they brought him back. He doesn't say a single word in either film, but he does hand the bag over in this film, which then Tom Cruise puts on his head, which he makes him do in the first one. Oh, okay. Okay. That's why you get a sort of like wry smile from Tom Cruise. He's like, oh, I know this game. We've done this before. Right. Okay. And I also thought of, in terms of casting, you have Josh Holloway showing mm-hmm. up at the start of this movie. And that's obviously a Lost Connection, which is a J.J. Abrams production. Sure. And then in the previous film, you had Carrie Russell showing up at the start, who, of course, did Felicity. Mm-hmm. Mm. No, I hadn't made that connection. Uh, and it was nice to see Josh Holloway in something other than Lost. I feel like he's one of those actors that sort of did that time and then hasn't done much since. I didn't watch Lost. Uh, oh. So this is my only exposure, I feel like, to Josh Holloway. Yeah, I didn't watch much of it either. Yeah, it, it, it's okay this is not a lost podcast so uh well, it, it, it it is lost out we're gonna there go to the podcast jail yeah. yeah it's okay <laughs> is it lost pod i guess we call it that pod hards uh, no not pod hards lost hards it'd be lost hards sure sure there you go lost hards there uh, you go. patreon bonus episode coming soon <laughs> uh the the last one i had now this is a deep cut and i'm probably looking too much into this but i'm wondering if brad bird is a star trek fan yes Red alert, I'm making a Star Trek reference. During the sandstorm sequence, Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise covers his face up in a scarf because of all the sand, and he's using his phone as like a little detector. The bleeping noise it's making is the same bleeping noise that Chekhov's tricorder was making whilst he was walking through a sandstorm in the Wrath of Khan, tracking down Khan. Boom. I'm just saying. Well... I know J.J. Abrams was a big fan of Wrath of Khan as well, and which is yeah. why you got Khan in um, in Into Darkness. Yeah, it could be. Is that the same year as this? No, no, no. Uh, two years, years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, that is a very distinct like doop 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 sort of noise. Like it just. It's... How did it go? 
I'll do it again if you'd like. <laughs> I, I had it easier. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. I, I hadn't been practicing that in the mirror all day. Um, no, I, 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 yeah, I just maybe I'm going mad. Let me know, folks. Write in if I'm reading too much into that. But I feel like that is such a distinct noise, and they're in both in sandstorms, both with their faces covered. Like it just feels like there's something there. Okay. I like that you're turning into Michael Winslow from Police Academy. <laughs> oh, making it with the sound effects. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I actually met him at a convention once. And uh, I was in the I was in the lineup to uh, get a, an autograph for someone else, uh-huh. and he decided it was in a, it was in a shopping center or a shopping mall you guys would call it in North America, and he got on the tannoy for the whole shopping mall, and did like an announcement with a ton of voices just like just ad libbed it basically, but like telling people to come over to his booth and get an autograph, mm-hmm. but then like started like advertising some of the shops in the shopping mall. Wow! I just thought it was such a weird thing to do, but like I, I remember everyone in the line, it, the whole convention was just smiling at the fact he did that. Wow, that's incredible. That's like a moment. It's too bad you didn't film it. I, I mean, this was like 2008 or something. Like I, I, I don't think I would have had the phone that could have done that. But hey, that was a moment, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And that's my connection to Michael Winslow. <laughs> and uh, I think that wraps me up for extra marks and points on Mission Impossible: Ghost Protocol. All that's left to do is to answer the question of the knock list. Now, Cam, as we have a guest, please explain to Jen and any new listeners that have stumbled upon our humble little show what the knock list is. Yes, the knock list is our tortured acronym for need to see official classics of the Spy Hearts podcast where every week after we talk about a movie, we decide whether it belongs in the pantheon of all-time great spy films. Some films have made it on Mission Impossible's 1, 3, and The Five Fingers also made it on, um, as well as some of the Bond films. Skyfall did, Casino Royale, Goldfinger. So um, it's not you know, exclusively just big franchise films. It could be anything. You can have obscurities. Uh, the Shersha Ronan film Hannah made it on, for example. So we like to keep it uh, as broad as we can. But the idea is basically it's a list that we can hand someone and be like, these are the best spy movies that anyone should enjoy if they like spy movies. Okay. They've gone through the filter of us and we have no credentials, but we like to pretend that we do. Right. So, Jen... As you're a guest, you get the first vote. Yes or no, do you think Ghost Protocol deserves to be on the knock list? Yes, I think people should see it. Right, you said it was the best Mission Impossible film of all yeah. time. So, yeah. I, I mean, like, if those other two had made it on, I guess it would only make sense that you would say yes to this. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's one yes. Cam, what do you have for us? This one's a yes for me as well. I think when we look at Mission Impossible as a franchise, it's a pivotal film. And it's Mm -hmm. going to turn us in a direction that I think people are going to really enjoy and also be frustrated by in the future. But this one in particular does it so seamlessly and perfectly that how do you not celebrate it when it's done on such a high level? You know, um, I've spent this episode having a bit of a love fest with this, but I think for me, it it doesn't quite reach the enjoyment levels I have with one and three. Mm. So... I mean, my vote doesn't mean anything now anyway. It's two yeses. So even if I said no, it wouldn't make a difference. It would still be going on the list. So I'm going to go with no because it didn't quite reach, didn't quite scratch that itch for me that the other ones did. But hey-ho, two yeses and a no. And as such, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol is making the knock list. The dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. There you go. That's the fourth Mission Impossible film in the bag. Jen, thank you for coming aboard. Spy Hards. We've had a pleasure having you on. You clearly know your Mission Impossible and your spy films. Any fan of Five Fingers is welcome on this show at any time. But um, just tell the listeners where they can find more from you and hear more from you. I am on Twitter. I still call it Twitter. Uh, social media at Film Intuition. My website is filmintuition.com. My podcast is Watch With Jen, which is available wherever you listen to podcasts. And thank you guys so much for having me. No, it was our pleasure. And honestly, (laughs) as much as we played it up, I was legitimately bowled over at the Five Fingers shout out. So you'll forever have a place in the Spy Hards canon for that. Okay. There you go. You, you've, entered, you've entered infamy now with that. Mm. And uh, there'll be links Uh-oh. in the show notes. Oh, in a good way. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> okay. There'll be links in the show notes below so people can click down there and find everything else about you. And um, you know, on your show, what have you got coming up? Coming up? Well, just recorded that episode on Carol Reed. And mm-hmm. in a few days, I have screenwriters Larry Karaszewski and Dan Waters will be back. And we are 
taking a look at Jan Michael Vincent last year, we looked at director Michael Ritchie. So I'm very excited about that. Oh, nice. What have we spoken about with Jan Michael Vincent? Was that uh, the mechanic? The mechanic, the mechanic yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, that was a, a, an interesting film with an interesting backstory and a, an original script that I think should have been made. I'll leave it there. People can go check out that episode. But uh, a little teaser. But Jen, it's been a genuine pleasure. Thank you very much for spending the time with us. I hope you've had a blast. We certainly have. And uh, recommend everyone go and check you out on Twitter and click those links below. Thank you. There you go, folks. That was our deep dive into Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. I want to thank our guest, Jen Johans, once again for coming on the show. You can find out more about her work on her website filmintuition.com there'll be links in the show notes below and uh i think before we talk about the next film we're going to be doing i want to remind everyone about the two spy master interviews we've got coming out next week cam why don't you just walk us through it yes we are going to talk on tuesday to greg smurs who was the stunt coordinator on mission impossible ghost protocol but mm-hmm. also some other Mission Impossible films as well, mm-hmm. and a whole host of other movies. Like, folks, this is going to be a deep dive into some of the coolest stunt work of the last, like, 20, 30 years. So this is a real treat. But you're going to hear all the inside scoop on how they pulled off the Burj Khalifa sequence in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. And, folks, it is edge-of-your-seat listening. So check that out. And also, we will talk on Friday to Ilya Volok who played the fog, the arms dealer that gives Tom Cruise's character, Ethan Hunt, all the crucial information that carries him on his journey in Ghost Protocol. Again, a ton of fun behind the scenes stories. So don't miss these two. Yeah, they are both fantastic interviews. I mean, I would say that because I was one of the two hosts of those interviews. But, you know, this is why I love doing the Spymaster interviews. You get so much behind the scenes stuff and the people are coming on to give their stories and both of our guests greg and Ilya, have got some fantastic stories about making the mission films and a bunch of other spy films they've both worked on as well so your mission folks should you choose to accept it in the classic mission impossible style is to join us next week as we sit down with mr greg smurz and mr Ilya volok and celebrate mission impossible ghost protocol if you like what you heard on this episode please consider supporting us over on patreon patreon.com slash spyhards you, well, I think we've actually reached 100 bonus episodes over there now. You'd have full access to those straight away at the uh, mid-tier level. And uh, basically, you're helping keep the lights on here at Spy Hards HQ. We pay quite a lot to host the podcast and editing services and things like that. So it's really just about supporting the show and you get a bunch of free stuff to go alongside it. Mm-hmm, definitely. And of course, you have to keep Cam uh, well stocked. <laughs> Help me, folks. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> he needs it. He, he desperately, desperately <laughs> needs it. And uh, if you don't already, make sure you follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, X, Instagram. Apparently, we're on TikTok. I'm not too sure. But uh, hey-ho, we're spies. We could pop up anywhere. That's right. But until next time, folks, you'll find Cam and I furiously practicing the art of drawing faces on our hands. Mm-hmm.